Welcome to Community Forum. Today is uh, March 22nd, 2023. And my name is Priscilla Almquist Olson, your host. And today, community reaches to Taunton, Massachusetts. Why? Because in Taunton, the Old Colony History Museum is located, and they have uh, a history of King Philip's War. I want to welcome Bronson Michaud, who is the curator of the Old Colony History Museum here in Taunton. Uh, and uh, Bronson, thank you so much for opening the museum and letting us have this wonderful program on King Philip's War. So the Old Colony History Museum has been open since 1853. And since then, we have been collecting, preserving, and exhibiting the history of the Old Colony region. That's in reference to the original Plymouth Colony, which today makes up Bristol, Plymouth, and Barnstable counties. Our three-dimensional object collection numbers at just under 10,000 pieces. We have nearly 400 linear feet of documents and photographs in our archives, as well as several thousand volumes in our research library. Beyond preserving, collecting, and exhibiting that history, we have a second goal to our mission, which is through uh, outreach and programs and events in the community sharing as much of that history with the public as possible. So my job here at the museum is curator of collections. I'm responsible for the objects, the archives, and the library. I put together the exhibits you see here. I give tours to the public and provide access to researchers to our collection. Much Bronson for making this day happen. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, panel um, consisting of Eric Schultz and David Ames and moderators Ed Hans and Marion Wingfield. Uh, and they're going to be talking about the hit, not just the history of the, of the King Philip's War, but its impact on the times uh, then and now. Um, and so Marion Wingfield uh, is a, has had a long career in museum education beginning at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology and the Harvard Museum of Natural History uh, of, at Harvard, where she served as head, uh, education, head of education. Um, and later she was appointed curator of education at the Hafenroth Museum of Anthropology at Brown University. And in both institutions, she worked closely with Native American tribal members on curricula and exhibits. Uh, and later she worked advising museum studies, master's degree candidates, and taught several years of museum education at Harvard University. Um, and most of you know Marion because she was the one who developed uh, the Office of Fundraising Development at Ames Free Library, uh, and she is currently retired. Ed Hands, uh, we all know Ed, he's one of our two town historians in Easton. Uh, former chairman of the history department at the Oliver Ames High School. Uh, he's the author of Eastern Neighborhoods, a wonderful book uh, that chronicles the uh, history uh, of the different neighborhoods comprising the town of Easton. Uh, he's conducted many historic tours of historic places and landscapes and um, cultural roots uh, has, has been one of, one of his topics. Uh, uh, he's been on the Agricultural Conservation Commission, et cetera, et cetera. Ed is a uh, well of information. Uh, most of you know what a great or orator he is, too. So he, he and Marion are going to be moderating today's panel. David Ames of the um, fa our famous Ames family uh, is here, too. He was the producer of uh, the King's Philip War video. Uh, with the help of Eric Schultz, who's also our panelist today. Um, and so Eric Schultz uh, is a professor. He is a, a native of Dighton and a proud Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School graduate. Uh, he's the author of four books, uh, including uh, King Philip's War, The History of Legacy of America's Forgotten Conflict, uh, which was produced in 1999. His most recent book, Innovation on Tap, includes a chapter on our very own Oliver Ames and the launch of his shovel works in Easton. He's a former chair and now director emeritus of the New England Historic Gene Genealogical Society and the Gettysburg Foundation. Eric is a current director of the Old Colony History Museum, 
uh, in which we are now standing. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Brown University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So that is the cast of characters that we have today, and we are so pleased that they were willing to create this very interesting and engaging program. So I hope that you enjoy it, and I want to thank Bronson Mashad for making all of this possible. So here's a little bit of history for all of you. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the program. Good morning, and we're here at the Old Colony uh, Historical Society and Museum. Uh, to talk about King Philip's War. And I have a panel of people who have made contributions in that area over the years. And uh, we're going to start with introductions. Our first introduction is going to be my friend Marion Wingfield. Hi, everybody. My name is Marion Wingfield. I have been a resident of Easton, Massachusetts, which was part of the King Philip's War for, you know, Long, long ago, I've worked at the Ames Free Library. My previous uh, work had been at the Harvard Museum of, I'm sorry, the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology and the Half and Refer Museum of Anthropology as head of education and curator of education, where I, you know, saw a few objects of King Philip's War and learned about it for the first time then. Great. Next. Hi, I'm David Ames. I grew up in Easton and uh, I came to King Philip's War fairly late, uh, and thanks really largely to Eric Schultz, who you'll be talking to soon. Eric has written a wonderful book that uh, it, uh, lists the sites, the actual sites where King Philip's War's battles were held. And if you're interested, and I became very interested, you can go and visit them. And so I have seen uh, 40 or 50 uh, sites of, from King Philip's War and taken many photos and read many books. And that's the uh, background, relevant background for me. Oh, I, I did produce a film uh, which uh, Eric was uh, one of the narrators for. So uh, it remains, I believe, about the only video for King Philip's War. And I remember taping that well. It was the coldest day of my life on the Plymouth <laughs> Plantation, I think in 2004. My name's Eric Schultz. Um, I'm a, a proud native of Dighton, Massachusetts, North Dighton. I'm also a director here at the Old Colony. And in 1999, uh, Michael Togus and I published a book called King Philip's War, The um, History and Legacy of America's Forgotten War. And we may want to talk a little bit about this forgetting part of part of the war. But for me, having grown up in Dighton, I used to pass by this place called Anawan Rock every day and, and wondered what it was. And then I ended up doing my undergraduate at Brown and visiting the Half and Leffer, got interested in, in the war. And um, my connection, maybe some uh, viewers feel this way, I, I love to look at source documents and primary documents but being where the action occurred has a way of sort of bringing it to life and making it real for me. So the point of the book was to build a travelogue and to make sure that people could find these forgotten sites, which are all around New England. That's excellent. I guess probably the place to start is a little bit of, uh, of history of the war. Um, when the first settlers arrived here, there was sort of like a tabula rasa between them and the Native Americans. And then over the first decade or so, um, they developed sort of a, a mutual uh, interdependence, uneasy interdependence, uh, which lasted for quite a while and then fell apart. So why did it fall apart in Indian War? Okay. So the, the Bayflower lands in 1620, and the American Revolution is fought in 1776. And 55, sort of right in between there is where this, where this uh, war falls. 55 years after the Mayflower and about 100 years before the War for Independence. Those 55, first 55 years are relatively peaceful. There are good relations between the English settlers and the Native Americans. And then suddenly it feels like overnight everything turns and they are at war with one another. So if you think back to when the pilgrims first landed, um, to sort of set the stage, 
Disease had been very important here in North America. For, we believe now in the hundred years before the Mayflower landed, the Na Native Americans may have lost as much as 90% of their population. Nobody knows for sure, but it could have been that high. So Massasoit and the Wampanoag weren't feeling especially powerful and strong when the Mayflower landed. And certainly the English were in no way ready to develop a real culture here with the skills that they brought from England. Um, the Puritan migration, which started in 1629 when, when the parliament is dissolved by Charles I, lasts for about 10 years. What you get is middle-class families, generally pretty well-educated, craftsmen, artisans, um, but not people who are ready to take on a wilderness. So what you have in the beginning is both sides feeling relatively weak. And I think that contributes to the friendliness because nobody is really prepared to, to exert themselves. In that decade of the, great, of the Puritan migration, 23 towns are formed from Maine to Rhode Island and 22 additional towns in New England are closed, which means there's no more land to give away, right? So you could, you could land in Boston and visit your relatives in Dorchester, but you couldn't stay because there was no land. Dorchester was closed. You had to start looking outside that at the next place that was going to be settled. So there's this enormous pressure for the English to acquire land during those years. And that, there are alcohol and firearms and disease and so forth, but land is really the reason that the, the, that the friction begins to build between the Native Americans and the English over this period. And by the time we get to 1675, you have the results of the Great Migration. You have a baby boom, and you have Philip and his people, and Witamo and Fall River and Tiverton and Awashonks and Sakonic and the Narragansett in Rhode Island feeling like they have been pushed from their ancestral land. And that is the spark that, that really uh, launches the war. Can I yeah. ask a question? Um, had it, when was it named New England? When was our when were these places named New England? I don't know the answer to New England. I know most of the towns were named because they mimicked the, the places yeah. that they were coming from. And did the English who came feel like they had the right to possess this land by divine right? Okay, so right. religion is one of the friction points, right, right? along with land. And you get the best picture of that from Increase Mather. Mm -hmm. Increase Mather is the minister in Boston. He writes the first contemporary history of the war. He's there's only one printer in the colonies. He's in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And he's racing William Hubbard, who's writing, who's the minister in Ipswich. He's writing his own history. And he's racing him to the printer. Mm -hmm. And he gets, but when you read Mather, you get a real feel for that. Because he says, look, we were put here to possess the land and to convert the so-called heathen. Right. That is our mission here. It's, this, it's Winthrop City upon a hill. And I don't think every English settler felt that way, but enough of them did, and it caused conflict. The Native Americans would lose people from their tribe when they moved to, a, say, a Christian village. Or when they converted, they would begin to lose their traditional way of life when someone converted to Christianity, and it created friction. And it was very difficult uh, for the Natives to put up with that zealous uh, proselytizing. <laughs> yeah. David, you, you know, know. Yeah, you know, I, I would just want to add, I think that the uh, trade goods played an awfully large role in this whole tension because what happened was that it didn't take very long for the natives to appreciate metal tools, textiles, and... Uh, you know, household goods, and they became essentials for the Indians. And this was okay for probably the first 30 years or so until the, uh, the fashion for beaver hats uh, faded and the demand for beaver uh, went away. And when that happened, the Indians really had very little to trade that was uh, uh, important to the English. So what they were left with was land. And, and this was, I think, the uh, major impetus for the Indians to sell as many uh, 
many pieces of land as, as they did. To um, answer your initial question, mm -hmm. uh, the name New England was on a, a map that was uh, completed by John Smith, so it might not even have been the settlers who made it. Will you, does somebody know the dates for the beaver trade? The great, you know, the, the decimating of the beavers. And when, when were women wearing beaver hats in England? And I think it was around 18, between 1840 and 1850. So this occurs much failed. later than what we're building up to in King Philip's time? Uh, yes and no. The problem is that um, beavers are pretty vulnerable. And so the beavers in southeastern Massachusetts were cleaned out relatively quickly. And I think that might be what David you is You mean well to. before the 1800s? Yes, well before the 1800s. So they were being traded in Europe before, yeah, in the, like the 1600s. The, the fashion for beaver continued and was a driving force in the, in the right. uh, French-Canadian uh, I thought I, I thought it came much later after King Philip. So it's interesting to hear that you say it's happened during the yeah, period of time building up to King Philip. It especially War. affected the Narragansett because they mm -hmm. turned once the beavers are extirpated from the from the coastal towns, you have to go inland to find them. And the Narragansett became middlemen and very successful middlemen at procuring beaver pelt from the inland tribes. They also be, were quite good at making wampum. They were known as the mint masters. So they had both of those pieces of this business, not traditional, they'd moved away from their traditional lives and they'd become businessmen as agents for the, for the English mm -hmm. and then the bottom drops out of this market through no fault of their own. It's fashion. And people stop wearing, uh, wanting, wanting uh, beaver hats and all of a sudden the economy collapses. And the other big question I had is when does alcohol get introduced? Because I read some primary, I read of primary sources that talked about whiskey bringing liquor. They, you know, the spelling of liquor is like L I K K E R, to the Indians. And and how is that? Do you know anything about that, how that's done and what effect that has on the natives? Yes, it came very very early. Um, you've probably heard that on the Mayflower. One of the reasons that they stopped where they stopped is that um, uh, their beer supply was getting low. Uh, and that's because people at this time tried to avoid drinking water uh, because it was impure. So um, very, very quickly at Plymouth Plantation, there were people that were licensed to sell liquor. And of course, like any other prohibition that didn't hold very well. And so it got into the, into the trade. I think one of the things we need to look at is uh, the role of uh, European animals because some of the more recent sources I've been looking at are, are saying that, you know, settlers were hungry for land, but so were their pigs. And the pigs yeah. came first, destroyed Native yeah. American gardens and cattle. And, and cattle as well, and made it, uh, made it uh, more difficult for Native Americans to hold on to that. Have you guys heard any of that? I have. Yeah. yeah. Well, when uh, I believe it's William Randolph is sent over after the war to assess for the crown what the damages are. And one of the things he counts is 8,000 head of cattle were killed. So, it's a, so, they are, so they are everywhere. And of course, what the English needed to do was fence their property, which was completely uh, you know, un uh, unknown. And uh, when they wanted to secure um, Native American property, the animals would somehow get out of the fencing and go off and eat and destroy that property. So yeah. it made it less valuable. Mm -hmm. So they were a tool in a sense and another point of friction uh, between, the, between the Native Americans and the English. Did they also bring over pigs? Were there pigs there involved were pigs. as well? Yeah, yeah there were. Yes. They were destructive. The pigs were pretty destructive yep. on crops. And they, uh, they eat uh, mast, acorns, et cetera, et cetera, which, uh, and chestnuts, which right. were part of the Native American food supply as well. And I think, I think there was uh, an instance where um, the the uh, Indians had uh, Native Americans had uh, had had uh, an, an island. I think they wanted to use to uh, you know bring their. It, it was a case of the shoe being on the other foot, 
and and uh, the it was the English who had the fields, and the Native Americans brought oh. whatever it was to this this island, and uh, this was really upsetting to the English who took it to court, and I think they were able to uh, to uh, have the Indians uh, discontinue mm -hmm. doing that. But uh, it was very interesting because I don't think that the uh, Native Americans were ever able to uh, get any justice from the courts for the damage. Well, it's interesting you say that because that is the event that really is the tipping point yeah. of the war when uh, John Sassamon, mm -hmm. who was a very interesting character, he'd been uh, educated at Harvard, he had uh, been with Wampsutta when he was captured by, by Winslow, uh, Josiah Winslow, just before Wampsutta suddenly dies. Um, he, he taught at uh, uh, Christian Indian villages and um, he's found under the ice at Aswampsit Pond in the winter of 1675. And the assumption is he was ice fishing and he fell in and drowned. Mm -hmm. About five or six months later, a native named Patuxin comes before the English and says, no, no, I saw he was murdered. And I know the people who murdered it. It was Tobias and Tobias' son and a, and a third Native American, Phillips people. So they get hauled into court at Plymouth and there is what you'd call a sham trial, basically. Mm -hmm. They knew it then. You read about it. Uh, it's been written about extensively now. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that when, this, when these three are convicted and they are executed, it's a miscarriage of justice. Um, whether Philip had Sassamon killed or not, we don't know. But Philip clearly would have known if he had who was responsible. Yeah. And he knew that a miscarriage of justice had taken place. And shortly after that, his men attack in Swansea and the war begins. So once the Native Americans realized that they had no more redress in the courts, and as you said, it was difficult all along anyway, but once they lose that last piece of ability yeah. to try to acquire some fairness in this relationship, that's the tipping point, yeah. and that's when the war begins. Yeah. And a prior uh, incident was the belief on the powder Philip that his brother might have been poisoned by the people at, at Plymouth. That's so, right. So Wamsett is captured by Winslow, and hauled into the, the governor, I think he was in Duxbury at the time, and questioned, are you planning to start a war? Have you teamed up with the, the French, the Dutch, the Narragansett? What's going on? And he answers the question, and he's allowed to go, and he's suddenly struck ill. He comes back to Plymouth, and there's a Dr. Fuller there who gives him a, what's called a working physics. Physic. We don't know what that was. And then off he goes to, to try to return to Bristol, to the homeland, and he dies on the way there. The Native Americans, certainly Philip, always believed he was poisoned. Mm -hmm. There is a doctor, contemporary doctor, who looked at the symptoms and thought it might be appendicitis. Oh. And if he was given a working visit, it would have been just as good as poison. So right. even yeah. unintentionally, he, yeah. may have been, he may have been poisoned. But suddenly here's this young man who didn't expect to be Sachem, Philip, who was thrust into a position of power. His father had died not long ago, Massasoit. His brother now, he thinks, has been poisoned. And now he's in charge. Is there anybody on this panel who isn't completely sympathetic to the Native people of this, of this time period? 50 years before the war, alien people invade their land, <laughs> give them things that they become to be dependent on, put up a court that they are beholden to, accuse them of crimes, let animals run on their fields, trampling the native people's fields that they for millennia had you know, cultivated and, and they knew what they were doing. Help the, the native people, uh, the English survive, in fact. Is there anybody who believes it was, this was anything, you know, okay? Like, did the English have God's, yeah. God's you know, <laughs> back or something? You're trying to get us in trouble on Twitter. No, I'm not, I'm not actually. I'm just, I'm so struck by the unfairness <clears throat> of what happened to the, and it happens all through history by every people through, to every other, you know, I'm not, I'm not naive, but I just reading and reading and immersing myself before he, coming here, I am so outraged for the Native people who, you know, they were getting their land taken away. They were, they, the English wanted them gone. They didn't see them as fully human. 
They were savages. They weren't Philip and Alexander and whoever else they named them. Were they Macedonian kings or something they were named after? They were, it was Medicom and it was Wamsuda and they were not kings the way the English were kings. And they didn't have courts and they didn't have thrones. <laughs> it's like, you know, just going to King Philip's, you know, throne right. is just, is that an insult to King Philip? How does that work for all of you? I'm just interested because I have this very... I'd like to take a more nuanced approach, as, as you know. It, there are a lot of nuances. I'm not saying there aren't ton, a ton of nuance in, in, on every side. A lot of nuance. So one of the nuances is the 90% defamation uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the population. Decimation, yeah. yeah, decimation. 90% Englishmen arrive in Plymouth Colony. And we can discuss the difference between Plymouth Colony and Massachusetts Bay Colony mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. there's a significant difference there. Uh, but you come into a, 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 an area that's essentially empty the large groups of Native Americans that still exist are away from you. You get established. That's one thing. The other thing is there's a huge, this huge difference in technology it is incredibly attractive to Native Americans and clearly a indication to the English that their culture is superior because, you know, they've got stuff. These other people want stuff. Clearly that shows that it's valuable, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other thing is, yeah, they didn't understand each other. Native Americans didn't understand the English, and the English didn't understand the Native Americans. It was a situation that was just ripe for disaster. Yes, for, for a, colon, a conquest, for invasion, conquest, and colonization. That's always a disaster for indigenous people. It has been for eons, and that's what we're looking at with King Philip. Can I put in a good word for the English? Go ahead, try. <laughs> okay, Roger Williams, right? There were individuals who I think um, got on well, John, understood. John Easton. Respect John Easton would mm -hmm, be one. Mm -hmm. I think Benjamin Church, before he mm -hmm. became, you know, the natty bumpo of the, of the war, um, was living um, side by side with the Washington Center people yeah. in, in Little Compton. Respected them, mm -hmm. were willing to trade with them and do business with them and treat them as human beings. In, in uh, Easton, um, James Keith, Reverend James Keith in, in Bridgewater, supposedly had excellent relations with Native Americans. He's the father of our, the person that built our oldest house. Um, yes, Susanna. However, uh, yeah. the history obviously is written by the conquerors, right. the people right. who won. And it's only written by the people who won. So it, of course they had good relations. Of course they, they couldn't they couldn't live without English goods. Of course, there were some English people who were kind to the natives, but overall, I think the natives were viewed as indigenous people have been, as less than human. Well, then and, how and they could they go to Harvard, which they were allowed to do? But they weren't, and they, and they learned how to be ministers because they were being converted. And if, as long as you were converted to, Christi to Christianity, you were okay, so you me, weren't I, a savage. So let me give you some other good English names. Okay. Jill Lepore. Francis Jennings. In other words, there are contemporary historians now who have tried to reclaim yes. some of this history, right? Yeah. Yeah. And without having a lot of source documents or firsthand accounts from the Native Americans, they have still tried to build a more yeah. balanced picture of the war. And that's what I, you know, am really interested in. Didn't sound really balanced there. <laughs> what? I said, didn't sound very balanced. You're, you've been an excellent advocate for the for the Native well, American point it, of view. But just think but about that, it. That gets to the question of sources, which I'd like to yeah, talk about. Yeah, and that, that's a big issue, really. One, one of the more recent books that deals with the issue of sources is Our Beloved Yen, mm -hmm. which to my knowledge is the first um, uh, book written by a contemporary Native American that goes back and looks at the sources in light of the traditional culture. Mm -hmm. And I think this is this is the balanced view. Talk about nuance. This is a wonderful piece. This mm -hmm. is a wonderful work. If anybody out there wants to read something written by a Native American, this is your book. And Jill mm -hmm. Lepore's book, Jill Lepore's book I maintain yeah. is excellent. This focuses on two people. Uh, Lutamu, the, the, who the English call the Squaw Sachem, yep. and uh, uh, James Printer, who uh, gets a Harvard education mm -hmm. and becomes the, the printer for the Harvard University Press. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and their different reactions to the to the changes that are going on. Um, it seems that when we look at the historical sources, uh, there were only two choices. There was either war, as King Philip ultimately advocated, uh, or total assimilation. Mm -hmm. But it, it also seems, if you read this book, that uh, I, I think Rotamo was trying to find some kind of middle, middle ground. And is it possible, given the huge disparities between the, the two cultures, in the issue of intention? I, I, I don't believe that initially the Eng English were trying to conquer North America. I think they were trying to establish a colony. That's a different thing than, than conquering. But was there any possibility of some kind of uh, compromise? Uh, in Latin America, the difference in population uh, demographics, there were a hell of a lot more uh, Native Americans than Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, made it easier to ultimately, after a, a period that makes our Native American problem here in New England look like next to nothing, um, there was an establishment of mestizo culture. Mm -hmm. uh, that never happened here. Um, um, maybe we should look into I why. I think it did in a way. Go ahead. Um, I think when large numbers of Native people were moved to the islands in the Caribbean for, I guess, sugar plantations, mm -hmm. is that what happened, or made captive? After the war, yeah. yeah. After the war, and when I, you know, Wampanoags and African Americans um, often got together, and so Wampanoags and, and African Americans are, you know, they they intermarried and they had children, and so you have this mix of Native people and African American slaves. So I think you do, it does result in something of that kind of a mixing mm -hmm. after a while. Mm -hmm. um, Couldn't that have come about uh, also because of the, of the praying towns that were established? Um, but these were just Christianized Indians who were with each other. I mean, it wasn't like we had African American slaves mm -hmm. in those praying towns. Um, do you see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, yes. I've always felt that the praying towns were for assimilated Indians. And that uh, really, uh, if you were in the praying towns, you had adopted the English way right. of life. And if, if you look at Nathaniel Philbrick's book, uh, The Mayflower, um, his claim was that the praying towns were another cause of the war because mm -hmm. Philip saw that as losing members of his tribe, which um, meant that he was being put in a weaker position versus, say, the Narragansetts, et cetera. Um, um, yeah. Has anybody read Caleb's Crossing by Geraldine Brooks about the first Native people on Mar um, Martha's Vineyard oh, to yeah. go to Harvard? And it's about one Indian who eventually dies. Mm -hmm. And it's a true story. But there was so much, um, it was happened around, I think, before King Philip's War. Mm -hmm. There's so much. Um, just uh, unhappiness among the Native people. And people like C Caleb, who's the star of the book, the narrator, I mean, not the narrator, uh, an important character, were looked down upon by Indians who are saying, we don't want anything to do with the English. Mm -hmm. He's going off to Harvard to learn how to be a Christian mm -hmm. minister. Um, you know, And there was a lot of divisiveness there. It was People were angry. I would say, you know, divisiveness starts... 30, 40 years before King Philip's War. Mm. It's, 50, I would say, 50 years because of all the incursions of the English on. And, you know, I, I'm interested in what you say about the English come initially to establish a colony. But what does that mean? They're just going to be an isolated colony. They're not going to grow. They're not going to raise their children. They're not going to need land for their animals. How many generations ahead are you thinking? What, what is it? How long ago was King Philip's War? Was it 300? Almost. 200, almost, almost 300 300 years, years ago. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, you're an ordinary person. You come over here. You're not involved in the colonial government. In fact, you try to avoid being involved in the colonial government. I don't think you can see those people as part of some scheme right. to... Uh, destroy the lives of Native Americans. No, I don't think that's what they set out to do. But given they were 
brought here by God, and they felt like, I am English. This is who I am, and I'm very connected with my God. This is my land. This is the land I want. Then that changes the whole dynamic. It's not like somebody, a housewife, you know, a wife cooking her food for is saying, I want to destroy this. This, you know, I want to destroy the natives. There's a great deal of fear about it. There, were, interestingly, there was a fear about becoming Indianized. I read this and I was like, what does that even mean? They were so closely put together. Mm-hmm that there was actually a fear of becoming more Indian than English. There was very little intermarriage between right, Native right, Americans right. And, and English. Uh, and in other colonies, of uh, uh, New France, for instance, that wasn't true. Uh, New Spain uh, also uh, the same. But here, here it was different. It was, uh, different. Uh, again, it's probably related to demographics. There just weren't a whole lot of Native American women to marry. Just because of the and the and the distance between the initial settlements and the settlements of the Native Americans created a, a buffer, a no man's land, mm-hmm. that allowed one side to get established and the other side to get uh, involved in their um, technology. And the technology factor is something we can't um, overlook. I want to get into uh, the unless you want to say a few more good things about Englishmen. No, I do. <laughs> I, I don't have a calculator, but 1975 would be 300 years, so we're three. We're coming up on, yeah. you know, closer to 350 or yeah, so. Yeah, I thought it was <laughs> almost 400. Just, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so we we've dealt with this issue that all the sources are uh, English. Um, how do we, uh, as historian, contemporary historians, come up with a balanced view of the war, or do we? Well, I think we can look in some places that that we haven't looked at before. And a few historians have tried this. Um, There's a wonderful sort of uh, audience in what I'll call the London coffeehouse crowd. So these are people from the moment the Mayflower sets down through King Philip's War. The colonies here in New England are are almost autonomous. The crown has a lot of other things going on in Europe, and there's sort of this fledgling British empire that's being developed, and they are allowed to operate these colonies in a very autonomous way, and they get used to it. So the, so the, so the, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the pilgrims are used to running things without a lot of interference from the crown. After King Philip's War, or during King Philip's War, you have this London coffeehouse crowd who's looking at the people who are our sacred founding fathers, you know, the Leverets and the Winslows and, and, and the Winthrops, and looking at them like low-level, bureaucratic screw-ups, right? They're going to lose the king's empire to a native population. Now, these people have never been to North America. They don't really know what's going on. But that sort of sentiment sort of uh, is wafting around London and makes its way up into the crown. So after King Philip's War, mm-hmm. it's if... If the colonies are in orbit around Great Britain, they're out by Pluto, all of a sudden they're in by Mercury. They get snapped back in close, and the crown begins to almost micromanage the colonies. So Plymouth Colony and Massachusetts Bay charters are gone, and all of a sudden there's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Governor Andros comes over and wrecks all of his sort of havoc. And, and, and what has happened is you've, you've planted the seeds of the revolution. Because you have a people who for three or four generations were autonomous, and now suddenly they are under the, under the heel of, of um, a king and a parliament and a prime minister who don't really understand what's going on in, in the colonies. And that will sort of, that friction will turn into taxation and representation, having soldiers stay in your home and all the things that lead up to the revolution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'm thinking of my ancestor, General Cudworth, who almost single-handedly lost the war, uh, but on part of the English. Um, let's talk a little bit about the difference between Massachusetts Bay Colony and, and, and Plymouth Plantation uh, in both their relations with the Native Americans and um, um, just their total approach to being here on the you know, New England shores. Well, you know that, so Plymouth is separatist. They are the extreme. They want out of the Anglican church, right? And, uh, but they're the old colony. They are the, they meet Massasoit. They are helped by Massasoit. They are, they're not around if there's no Wampanoag helping them out because they're not prepared to establish a home here. 
when they first get in. They lose half their people in that first winter. It's very, a very difficult start. Massachusetts Bay is this, this is the Puritan migrate. This is Winthrop's fleet in 1629 showing up and building their city upon, upon a hill. And they're not separatists, but they want to be able to practice their religion in their own way without interference uh, from the Church of England. So you have different starts, uh, if you will. You can see this play out at the beginning of the war because Swansea is attacked and both uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts Bay say, that's, that's your war. That's Plymouth Colony's war. We don't want any part of that. And it's only when the Nipmuc attack Menden that Massachusetts Bay realizes this is going to be a, a, a general war and they're all going to have to pitch in. But you can feel the separateness of the two colonies by the way they react right at the, right at the start of the war. Mm. And there's a difference in their view of the Native Americans because don't most of the, well, doesn't, doesn't Elliot, the man who wants to convert the Indians, he came from Massachusetts. It wasn't, right. it, it wasn't a uh, priority at Plymouth Col Colony to convert the Indians. I think if you kind of hold that image of the city upon a hill, that's what the, the Massachusetts Bay is trying to create. They are trying to create God's, you know, God's place on earth. And so that gives them license, as you were talking about earlier, to move the existing people out of the way if they're in the way of, of, of God's plan. I don't think the, the pilgrims felt that way. Yeah, so and, and I difference. think it's important to note that the city on a hill idea was very much, we're going to do it our way, and if you want to come to Boston and be part of our community, that's fine. But we're not here as a refuge for any English who are looking for a better Anne way. Hutchinson or Roger yeah. Williams yeah. or right. Anne Hutchinson. Gone. Right. Do you can I ask you if you agree? This is Joe Lapore. After a hundred nearly a hundred years of repetition on successive American frontiers, this forms the basis of American nationalism as it, as it emerges in the late 18th and 19th century. So the King Philip's War and what happened and how it echoes its way across the country with native populations being removed, decimated, and so on. Do you think this, this actually forms the basis of our very unique American identity as a nationalism? Well, I've learned never to disagree with anything that Jill Laporte writes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I agree Well, with that. American <laughs> nationalism, it's a unique, it really is a unique nationalism, right. you know. Right. And, and, and you could argue that what happened here starts that, the, the basis of it. I don't think there's any question. That you can, <clears throat> the way natives are treated during King Philip's War mm -hmm. becomes a template yeah. for you know, the Trail of Tears, yeah. Yeah. Everything. everything that happens after that. Mm -hmm. But also the way veterans are treated. You know, the veterans, so before the Great Swamp Fight, the veterans from Massachusetts <laughs> Bay and I think Plymouth both assemble on Dedham Plain which is, I believe, now the Hyde Park section of, of Boston. And the governor comes out and says, if you win this battle, you will be given land, right, as, as part of your bonus. <coughs> they go down and they win the Great Swamp, and we could talk more about that, but they, they, they win it, and it takes some of them 50 years. They, those veterans never see that land. Their children and their grandchildren will see it. And it, they end up forming six different towns, Gorham, Maine, and, and so forth. But the veterans never see it. And that also creates a similar, similar to what we were talking about with Native Americans, the way the country treats veterans. Now, we're better or worse at different times, but we value soldiers very highly before the war, and we don't tend to value them quite as highly after the war and after, the, after they've won. So are you suggesting mm -hmm. that giving people land in Maine is a way of history? Right. They ended up all convening on Boston Common, in fact, I think in the early 1720s or 30s and trying to get their land fund. Mm -hmm. I would disagree a little bit with Jill Lepore. Um, okay, you better call her, Eric, just call her right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bring her, bring her down here. Um, you know, one of the things that, that fascinates me about any of our terrible things that we did is that there were always people standing off to the side that didn't have the wheels of power yep. that were opposed to this. And uh, that was true in King Philip's War. We talked a little bit about Roger yeah. Williams in a minute or two. Um, but after it was over, 
as you've pointed out, this sort of becomes the forgotten war. Mm -hmm. I think that American nationalism probably was born in the contact between um, the uh, five civilized tribes, uh, the Iroquois, really potent, large Native American concentrations. Yes. But, and, and just, just let me finish the point. When we talk about the Trail of Tears, New England was the number one people that were protesting against the removal of the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. So in ironic. A, it, well, <laughs> maybe it's not ironic. Maybe people actually learned a lesson. What? Which was? Which was? Don't you know, remove. Yeah, Native don't remove people. people. Let's let's try to come up with some way that that's yeah. But work out. the five the civil, so so called five civilized tribes were on beautifully fertile, the most fertile land in the country with gold. With gold, and they they. Was it Jackson? Didn't want they, they, they needed to be removed. It doesn't keep much, no matter how much they learned English or assimilated or had a newspaper. And the Supreme or went Court re ruled that they had the right to stay, and the president illegally removed them. Removed them, yeah. and then he got on a twenty dollar bill. Yes, <laughs> temporarily. We're going to get rid of. Well, them. it's just it just. But to me, the the beginning. I you you disagree with me, but I do. I agree with Jill Lepore that the beginning is in this forgotten war nobody learns about in high school. That's something we talked about right at the yeah. beginning. Our own New England education doesn't necessarily include much about King Philip's War. The reason that we, the yeah. reason that yeah. this is here is because of awareness. So many people come into this museum yeah. in Taunton and they've lived in this area their entire life and they say, what is King Philip's War? Mm. So this is so this display is in part just to just to yeah. make sure yeah. that people understand that this thing happened and you drive by it the ghosts of it every single day. And this mm. is the second war that we had with the Native Americans. The the Pequot War in 1637 ended in a massacre of Native Americans, uh, and um, it was a, a horrible war. It just wasn't a general New England war. They had yeah. a, they made a film about that. I don't know if you've seen it at the Fox, at the Pequot Museum. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I've seen that. It was brutal. Uh, I by mean, the way, I want to put in a good word for your uh, Reverend Keith, because at the end of the war, there's a great debate amongst the clergy whether the children uh, should pay for the sins of the of the parents, right? And King Philip's son and his wife are both at risk during this conversation. And the question is, should we execute them or not? And Keith comes to their aid in his own way and says, no, no. So they end up getting sold into slavery, which is not, which is better than, better than execution. It's not a great solution, but at least it's better than what, and, and Keith is in part responsible for that. What that brings about, though, is a really interesting, I'll call it a myth because we can't prove it. But when I was doing research for the book, mm -hmm. there is a story that Philip's son slipped over the side of the boat and saved himself. He went to Canada. Oh. And there are a group of people in Canada, in Michigan, who call themselves the Royal House of Poconocket, and they believe that they are descended from mm -hmm. King really? Philip. That's wild. I wish you'd had that in the book. It's a great story. <laughs> it's, I think you need it's to. It's speculative. I, need to, I think you have to write another one that incorporates. Yeah. You know, but you know, of course, we do have. We do know that Mass Massasoit, through his daughter Amy, mm -hmm. had children who who uh, settled at Betty's Neck in Lakeville, oh. and uh, Zerviah, and I'm blanking on her last name. She had a, a war with the Massachusetts government over land and had to prove her genealogy. So our General Pierce. Who in the other room we have his jacket with the his uh, his arm was shot off during the uh, during the Civil War. He helps her write the genealogy of Massasoit, so that exists. Really interesting. And uh, Pierce is pretty rough on folks like uh, to to give a different perspective on folks like Benjamin Church, because Pierce goes to Anawan Rock in Rehoboth. He's only got one one good arm because he lost the other in the war, and he climbs down Anawan Rock and he says. That was easy. I don't know. I don't know what Benjamin Church was complaining about in his book, or bragging about. Or yeah. bragging about. And, and that's an interesting right. thing about Church. He is first of all, he starts off as a friend of the Native Americans. He's living. He's sort of like a Natty Bumpo kind of a, mm -hmm. a figure. Then he realizes that he can get ahead by using that expertise against the Native Americans, 
And then he becomes this tremendous self-promoter and um, writes one of the very first books about the war. That's good, yeah. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about Roger Williams. Um, Roger Williams starts off as a great friend of the Native Americans, but at, during the war, he did support the war effort. Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? You know, I, I, think, I think he at some point he had to because um, the destruction that was going on, I mean, there's a certain hardening that goes on yeah. in a war. Yeah. You know, we've seen it in all of our wars where, the, where your opponent goes from being people to being something less less and, than people, yeah. it's very hard to escape that. I think if you're in the middle of, of, of the destruction, so I, I mean, I give Roger Williams a lot of credit as long as he held out. But you know, he tried to save Providence, yeah. right? He, he went out and had a meeting and tried to save Providence, and they ended up burning yeah. half the town. I think that so made him. Yeah, that was sure. not a happy that made moment him very for bitter. him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, do you know the story of Roger Williams and the apple tree? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know whether it's appropriate here or not, but um, he was buried on what, what's now College Hill at Brown, and his grave was lost, like we lose a lot of things. We lost Elizabeth Pole here in Taunton until she, she was uh, dug up when they were digging up Main Street. And um, they find his grave on College Hill, I'm going to say 1820s, 1840s and they're doing some other work and they find his grave and it's right next to an apple tree. And the apple tree root has grown through his, and there's a root that looks just like his body. So they cut it off and now it's in the, if you want to visit it, it's in the Rhode Island Historical Society, the apple tree that wrote, that ate Roger Williams. Is <laughs> that is very appropriate. That's not in the book either. <laughs> but it's a fun story. Seems like a, a lot of things are operating by divine right. Look, it's a reason for people to get out and visit these museums mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. there's so much in these museums yeah. that that, uh, that is instructive and fun to, mm -hmm. fun to see. Mm -hmm. I want to put in a good word for teachers. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Whether they're English or, Nat or Native Americans. Uh, and uh, the problem is with state standards, uh, any Native American history gets thrust at the lowest level of, of school, which is great because you can, you can do the first Thanksgiving and everybody gets along. Isn't it great everybody gets along? Yeah. But um, there's no real ex exploration of, of the real issues. And then by the time kids might be ready to look at some of the uh, uh, nuances of this, you just don't teach that. It's not in the standards, uh, which is unfortunate. We did right. a very innovative thing. At the, I can't take credit for it, though. It was there before I got there at the Hafenruffer, in which we had, I think we had, sec is it third or second graders that learn about American history? It's second. Or Native Americans. Well, when I first started, is so it ironic. was first, second, and third grade. History yeah. was the Pilgrims mm -hmm. for three straight yeah. bleeping years, right. uh, but it's sec officially second grade. Second now. grade, so they, we'd get a, a school group, and somebody, one of the docents we had, devised this beautiful piece of cloth with um, covered in red oil cloth and had Velcro attached to it. Mm -hmm. And we talked about King Philip's War and how they ended up losing so much of their territory. Mm -hmm. And one by one, the kids would come and rip off a piece of the red oil cloth and what remained were little tiny red dots one on martha's vineyard aquina mm -hmm. and another one in the middle of the state i can't remember exactly what mm -hmm. Mar wampanoag territory is now in 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 massachusetts yeah. but it was all over new england right. gone mm -hmm. their territories were gone and it was you know it was something that little kids can sort of relate to this was mine, and somebody took it away from me. And that's the only level we right. could hit with them. I mean, they're concrete thinkers. They're eight. You know, they don't have much of a history themselves. Right. So and it's a little ludicrous to me that that's when we're teaching it. <clears throat> However. Yeah, no. No, I would agree. I mean, the King Philip's War, it's a tough story. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it's not something for young kids. But, you know. That's when we teach Native American history to second graders. Yeah. It, it <clears throat> sort of speaks to the, the hope that there needs to be, and there was in the 70s, there needs to be mini courses that deal with issues of um, otherness, the, the African American story, the, mm. the Native American story, <clears throat> and put that into a, into a course and look at it 
in in the other forty nine states besides Florida, you'd be able to teach that, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and or at least here in Massachusetts, in you'd Texas, be able, to, yeah. yeah, or Texas, but you'd be able to to teach that here and give kids an opportunity to think, because kids are great when they have an opportunity to think. They really are. Mm -hmm. We now have a wonderful, I have to put in a pitch for the organization in Easton called Raising Multicultural Kids. It's this very wide ranging organization started by a woman who adopted three children of color. And she was aware that they weren't treated equally in the Eastern public schools, and she now they now have diversity ambassadors in the classrooms at the uh, Blanche Ames mm -hmm. School, and they really advocate for teaching about our American history. And they're also making sure that um, because <clears throat> um, a lot of the standards for elementary is reading and reading and writing mm -hmm. and arithmetic, but uh, in reading. They're trying to make sure that there are books that represent right. uh, minority views or, you know, uh, some of these issues that we've discussed. And that's yeah. that absolutely is something that needs to happen. It's, it's mm. pretty radical to have this this institution in town. They're doing really good work. Yes. I would say that um, I, at the times I've spoken to, to, to younger kids, second, third, and fourth grade, they are spellbound by the story of the war. Yeah. They really are. I, yeah. I didn't feel, and you know, you don't have to go into the, right. the gory parts, but they are, they are very interested in the war. And I think I'm not an educator. I don't have to deal with this every day and try to make, you know, try to make sense of this. But it seems to me that you could, you could yeah. find a way to teach it that in works. the classroom. Yeah, I agree. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think to your point earlier. And there's no Native American here on our panel, and I don't pretend oh, I to, rep to, ask to represent that. to represent them. But they, there are parts of the Wampanoag people who didn't fight in the war and maintained their culture and their tradition um, straight through the war. They didn't lose it. Uh, Martha's Vineyard on on parts of the Cape, and so they have a, uh, a sort of a seamless past mm -hmm. where they were able to carry forward their their tradition. I read, I saw maybe at Sturbridge that there were WeTus that were in operation mm -hmm. in the late 1700s mm -hmm. in New England. Yeah, I attended a conference and um, it was on. Did I know you then? Yeah, it was <laughs> a long time ago, but you did. Uh, and that was that was a story that that this particular it was a genealogy thing, yeah. and this particular family lived in the WeTu. Uh, I'm getting a sign from, from our director, so uh, I think we have to wrap it up. How about we go through the panel and ask for one final comment from each member of the panel, and we'll give you the last word. Uh, so we'll start over here. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that we're talking about King Philip's War, and I am particularly proud to be a director of the Old Colony because it's one of the places where we, where we try to preserve the history of yeah. the war. Well, I've been uh, enjoyed very much being part of this and uh, look forward, hopefully, to a increasing uh, attention uh, being paid to this and, and other, other uh, areas which deal with the uh, different populations we have here in this country. I think this day is coming. Yeah. I think this is a wonderful conversation, uh, and it's been a lively one, and um, it's it's needed, and it does show that uh, for those people who believe that history is only important if it's useful to the present, this is useful for the present really because these is. issues are still with us. Yeah, they, they don't go away. I think they're. Oh. Am I, is it time yep, for my last it's your word? time. I've been, I've been reading a lot about chimpanzees and, and our close relation to them. And there's a new film made by the guy who did My Octopus Teacher about mm -hmm. chimpanzees, and it's called the, the Rise of the Warrior Apes. Okay, so it doesn't get more reductionist than that. But it happens all the time. It is a human story, what happened to us. But I'm, I really enjoyed this conversation. Enjoyed meeting you, re-meeting you. You sparring with you, yes. but I just want to leave with Eric's book um, for people to see because I think it's a really important foundational book, especially with its help finding these sites. I know lo people love this, and I don't think everybody knows about your book. Thank you. I also want to put in a plug for Jill Lepore's book, King Philip's War, and 
Ed, thank Ed for introducing me to Lisa Brooks. She's an Abenaki woman. Um, we call, what is it called? My, my beloved king. Our beloved, our beloved king. king. Excuse yes. me. Yeah. And Ed's been talking about this for like months, and I finally started reading it. It's excellent. So thank you we all. Sh we yeah. should also put in a plug for, uh, was it it's Brown University website, or is it the Half and Reverend? Oh, yeah, the Half and Reverend Museum of Anthropology has a website, and they have a document or a, a a teaching, a curriculum yeah. uh, piece on the land, uses of the land that's wonderful. So you should check that out online. Thank you, everyone.